Well, good morning this great sunshiny day, everybody. Okay, today is scripture reading is 1 John 3, 1 through 2. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So be it. Well, most of you have met my father, or at least you can kind of tell he's my father because I look like him, you know. That's where I get my good looks from, just so you know. I, I just said I get my good looks from him. That may mean it's just this much, but. So, you know, and sometimes your dads do things that inspire you. I got to tell you what my dad did this morning to inspire me. He got up at quarter till five to get ready for church. Now there's a thing here that he taught me from that. Be sure to set your watch from Eastern time to Pacific time. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that we have the freedom to come and worship you. Lord, we do thank you for the gifts of good fathers. We just come to you today because we are your children, born of the Spirit because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. We thank you that as a heavenly father that you loved us so much that you would give your only son to die for our sins so that we could be adopted children of the Most High. Lord, fill us with your spirit today. Lord, we thank you that the spirit even cries out when we can't in relationship to a heavenly father. And we thank you for Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. We just thank you and praise you. Open our eyes, to hear, our eyes to see and our ears to hear what the Spirit has to tell the church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitled this God the Father, and if you've listened to any of the sermons and stuff, I've tried to talk about the person, and I even have tr trouble using that with God, but it's the closest thing that I can relate to. But the person, humanity, and everything of Jesus, and we, and we can understand that a little more because Jesus came in the flesh. And then I've talked about the Holy Spirit, that it is He who is living with us, that it is God Himself living in the form of the Spirit, not just some power or anything else. It is God living in and through His people. And you can put a face to Jesus, whether it's accurate or not from pictures, so that you can see that humanity or that person. And I hope that you can see that in the Spirit by realizing that the Spirit is a person in you. In fact, Jesus said He was the Spirit, so you can picture Jesus. But it's even harder for me, I don't know about for you, to picture God. But God is a Father. So maybe you can picture that as, as fathers that you know, earthly fathers. Maybe you picture as Jesus again. But see, God the Father, creator, sustainer of all things, wants to be in a relationship with you. And it's easier to picture that relationship when you picture a person. So I want to talk about God the Father today. And we're going to do a little vocabulary lesson, learn some words, you may know them, you may not. We're going to do three of them today. The first one is Av. It's a Hebrew word. It means head of the family. It is the one who gives life to children. So therefore, there's an understood relationship of kinship, of family, but not necessarily more than that. And I've been pondering that, and I've talked to several people in the last few weeks that that's as much of a definition they know about a father, the one that gave them birth, because they don't know the intimacy that God wanted and designed for fathers to have with their children. 
especially their sons. Because a father is supposed to be the one that trains up his children to follow in the ways of the Lord. Genesis 2.24 is the first place where that word is used. And it's read that we read this. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Children, marriage, all ordained by God before sin ever came into this world. Because God wanted to have a relationship with us. And then I think about that and think about the things that I have done, the things that mankind has done in the faithfulness of God. And he knew all this beforehand and knew that it would cost him the life of his one and only son. But yet he still wanted to have a relationship with me. Now I'm starting to get a picture of what a loving God looks like. If you learn a little bit about Hebrew, there's 22 letters in their alphabet. Each letter has meaning. Each letter has a numeric number assigned to it. When you put them together and make words, there's a new numeric value that comes out of it and a new meaning to the words. And see, we don't think about that at all. We, we've got our alphabet, and hopefully all of you can sing it and everything. You know what I'm talking about. But there seems to be more randomness to the words. That's not the case in Hebrew. And most words that start off with av have something to do with God, like Father, like Adam, Adam. Because those are related to God and His attributes and character, His love, His holiness, and His love for you. If you take the word father and look at it, you combine the first and second letter of the Hebrew language. And you read right to left, not the other way. So you start off with the A of the alphabet and the B of the alphabet. And the A, the meaning means to be an ox, a strong leader. And then the B would be a tent or house. And think about the fact that we dwell in tents on this earth. This is our temporary residence. You see that all throughout Scripture. Because this is not our home. Our home, Jesus said, don't be troubled because I am going to, to prepare a place for you. That's why He went away and that's why He sent the Holy Spirit to be our guide and companion and reveal all truth to us and show us everything that Jesus taught us and did. Because Jesus is the Father. Think about all of that with the Trinity and the triune God. So we've got Father means a strong leader of His household. But now think about it in practical terms because we can see this and think about spiritual terms. An ox is the one that leads the cows and the calves to safe pet pastures and He protects them from predators. Think about that. That's the job of a father. But you still don't see the love in there. You see the duty of a father. And then you have plus that house. So the father is a strong leader and protect his, protector of his family. Some fathers have done that. Some fathers have failed at that. The problem with this country, a lot of it is the absenteeism of fathers. That they're not even there. But it still doesn't show a relationship that a father is supposed to have to his children, especially his son. And we went, a reason I quoted the first usage of it is we see the relationship of a father to, or a husband to his spouse as well. Remember that all of the letters that start off with a certain letter relate to that master term or whatever. That's the way I can say it. So all of these words are related to God. You might not have had a good father. So you might not understand that relationship. But this relationship was from the beginning of time that God, the creator of all things, wanted to have a relationship with you and it was in the form of the love that a father has for his son. And yet God loved you so much that he gave his one and only son to die for your sins so that you could be made right, so that you could have eternal life, and so that you could have life to live as his holy child here in this world, this physical world, because the kingdom of God is at hand. When Jesus died on the cross, Satan lost all of his authority, all of his power. Death lost its sting. 
you can live by the power of the Holy Spirit to be like your heavenly Father. Jesus said to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now even the letters, the way they're made up, have meaning also. Here is an example of the first letter. And if you'll notice, there's three pen strokes. The top pen stroke represents God. The bottom pen stroke represents man. If you were a Jew, you'd say, I didn't tell you the truth there. You'd say that that was God and Israel. Think about that, because fa the father of a nation. And then the middle pen stroke would represent what if you're a Jew? The Torah. The law. But can the law save you? No. As Paul said, the law just shows you, and I don't know if I showed it over here. I need to show it better over here. So God, Israel, but I'm going to say man, and this connecting, the Torah, or since the fact the law only points to how guilty and much of a sinner and how lost and desperate we are, Jesus. Because Jesus does for us what we can't do for ourselves, what the law can't do for us. He was the propitiation, the ransom for our sins so that we could become children of God. There's so much knowledge in here in their language and everything else. And all these words, like I said, that start with that letter represent something to do with the relationship with God. And that's what a father is. They're not just random. It all has meaning, and if you study it, it'll just enlighten you, and I hope that it gets your mind thinking and you want to study it a little bit. Because you could study the Hebrew language, the Greek, the Bible. You could study it your whole lifetime and just get just this much knowledge. There's so much out there. But as you hunger and thirst for it, God will fill you more, and through His Spirit, He will teach you more and more and more. Last week we talked about the woman at the well in Samaria, and I want to go back there for just a minute. Because mankind without God is not only pitiful, but they're lost for all eternity. And you have a longing to be in a right relationship with God because He created you in His image. And only Jesus, the Torah won't do it, only Jesus will fill that void in your soul. And that's why Jesus that day went to that, to, to that woman in her sin and shame and told her who He was. He is the one that brings living water to our soul. So I'm back in John chapter 4, four starting in ver verse 4. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. And we have a father and a son, and we have this well here that brings life to the community. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? The conversation starts with Jesus coming to her and ask her if she will give him something. But she can't give him without first receiving. Okay? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? She thought Jesus would look down upon her, but he didn't. And the scripture goes on to say, For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God, not only the gift of life and creation, but the gift of redemptive life through Jesus Christ, so that you could be a son or daughter of the Most High, that you could have a Father in heaven. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked Him and He would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? We continue to look at things through a physical lens. When Paul warns us, we are, we're fighting a spiritual battle. Verse 12, Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it? 
as did also his sons and his livestock. Now think about ox, think about the job of a father, think about this is many generations now and the respect and authority that the father has built in the son so that he could be a father. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. No matter how much love that your earthly father gives you, he cannot protect you from an eternity apart from God. He can protect you best he can on this earth, but he's very limited even there. But that doesn't mean that he won't try to protect you, just like an ox protects and guides and nurtures. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right that you have had no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Now you can say Jesus is pointing out her sin here, or you can say he's pointing out the void in her heart. And that's the direction I'm going today, in the direction I went last week. That there's a longing, there's a thirstiness, for you to know God that He has instilled in you. And sometimes we run from our Father because we don't think that He is that type of individual. We take for granted that He is caring for us and that His laws are for our protection and that He really does love us. He's not just some big rule leader and when we bend the rules we get discipline. He has rules because He loves us. And you can see the, the resemblance in an earthly father. Verse 19, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on the mountain. So we go to worship. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father. Now we've got the Greek word for father used the most. The best way I can pronounce it is think of potatoes. So... Pataya. I probably still butchered it. Did I? Uh, close enough? Did you know what it is? At least he knows what it is. It might have the southern slang on it or whatever, but my Greek scholar knows what I'm talking about, and I'll probably pronounce it differently in a minute. <laughs> it's the definition of a father in Greek based off of kinship again. Same basic definition. When it's capitalized, you see it capitalized in Scripture, it refers to God as your father, kinship the one who gives you life. But we still don't have a definition of what a father is like as far as a relationship with his children. We know that he gave us life. But God is love, right? And for us, again, I'm going to say for many of us, that's hard to put that to a father because we didn't have it growing up. We didn't have a loving father that cared for us and provided for us. And he might not have even been in the picture. Verse 22, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. And I skipped the end of that, so let me finish reading it. Because I skipped the verse before. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. And I will probably teach some more on this, but you've got the same word here again. I'm going to say potato because it's easier. <laughs> the same word here of this kinship to a, to a father. And that father is actually seeking you as one that will worship. Now don't take that out of context for an earthly father. But you know, one of the things an earthly father just wants from his children is love and respect. Something that we all want in this world. And he is doing, if he's doing his job, 
He is trying to guide us, especially His Son, to be men so that they can be good fathers. Verse 24, God is spirit and His worshipers must worship Him in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called the Christ is coming. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. Jesus declared, I am the one speaking to you. I am He. So we get the Son in the relationship with God. The Son carrying out, because we don't know it yet, but that's why John writes the gospel, so that you will believe, that you see the, the signs that tell you that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the chosen one, who will save His people. Jesus had to bring salvation or rest to this woman's soul. But she had to decide if she was going to drink. And he asked her point blank up front, will you give me a drink? Will you let that living water spring up inside of you so that others will see it? Then Jesus told the woman what he was offering her, what she really needed, would she receive it? Because we can't fix the problem on our, law, on our own. The law can't fix it for us. We have to realize our need for living water. The law points to that, but only Jesus Christ is the answer. He is the way, the truth, and life to the Father. And then we see the involvement of the Holy Spirit in His job of revealing Jesus, revealing the, God the Father to us something that we could never understand unless we were born again, that God so loved the world. It seems foolishness to people that don't know and don't understand. But to those that are born again, you see the passion of Jesus Christ because a father loved you so much that he gave his son, his one and only son, to die for you so that you could be adopted as his children also. And the Holy Spirit binds you as His child and guides you into all truth. We also went over John 14, so I'm going back there again. In John 14, verse 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father, my Patea, my Father's house has many rooms, as opposed to this temporary dwelling place. These temporary things that satisfy us, that protect us, that make us happy. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the place where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only thing that will make a difference, the only thing that will bring you into a relationship with God so that you can understand Him as Father. No one comes to the Father, not to God, but the Father, except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father, Jesus' Father. How Jesus knew God the Father in this perfect father-son relationship. You will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know Him and you have seen Him. And there's where I go back to the person again. If you can picture Jesus, then picture the Holy Spirit, picture God as your Father who loves you more than any earthly father you could ever fathom whether you had the best dead there was or the worst dead there was, or he was absent or whatever. God is the perfect Father, and he loves you so much that he would sacrifice his son. Think about that. Wow, what greater love that a man has to lay down his life. But God as a father asked his son to be obedient even unto death to save you and I. So now I'm going to skip over to 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. This is how we recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the, from the, in the flesh is from God. We see the Trinity at work again. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is even now already here in the world. So start looking at things spiritually, not just physically. You dear children, you children are from God and you have overcome the world. You've overcome them. 
Because the one who is in you, the one, the person again, God himself, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is greater than the one who is in the world. Who is in you? The Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, the Son, God the Father, all living inside of you. <clears throat> They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. But we are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of a falsehood. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Now, the definitions I've given you so far, have you seen love? I mean, an ox takes care of the, of the cows and the calves, but is there love there? A father gives life to his son, to his children, but is there love there? And John here is describing the love of God and how it should be manifest in you because you are his child, so you should love like him. And the key element here is learning the love of a father. And ask, like I said, it's not by coincidence that I've talked to several people that said, I did not understand that because I did not have a father like that. I don't understand that. Understand, you know, some of you have seen good fathers in other relationships. Understand that the best father in the world doesn't hold a candle to God, but you can see some of the attributes in God in that father. Fathers were designed to be the ox of their household, take care of their house because they love them. Not because they just want to make rules or they want to be in charge or anything else, but because they love their families. And they're training up their sons to be the same kind of leaders. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Huge concept, a father who loves. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And therefore his children love, especially fathers love their sons. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. I hope through some of the things that I've said here that you think even more strongly about a Father's love, your Heavenly Father's love, that He could give up His Son to save you. That is just beyond my comprehension. But I can accept it because it's true that God loves me that much. So when I'm whining and saying, why me, Lord, and all these things, I know my Heavenly Father loves me. I know He will never forsake me. I know that He will give me the strength, because Jesus said when He taught us how to pray, that, that if we ask our Heavenly Father, He will give us more and more of the Spirit to walk through this world so that we get home one day. And so that we train up our children and others that we encounter to find the way home also. We can't save them, but we can love as God loves. We can be holy people as God has commanded us to be. And we can teach our children to be like God. They still have to choose to drink. And hopefully they will and hopefully springs of living water will flow from them. God loves us so much and He has called us from the darkness into the light, if only his children will hear his voice. But for many, like I said, they don't have that concept of a good father. So it's tough to see their heavenly father that way. So I want to introduce a third word to you, and you've heard it. And you've probably heard a lot of truth about it, but I don't know if you've heard all the truth, and I'm, and I'm going to bring some more to the light today, and you may know it already. Third word I want to mention to you is Abba. It was the common word, but I hate using common. But it was the word that a son used to his father. Now, you've probably heard that said as dad or daddy. And that is true, but you've got to understand the meaning behind this to understand this. Because daddy does mean something different when I call my dad my dad versus father. It shows a relationship that I have now. 
But if you don't understand what that relationship is, you still don't understand the use of that word. It's the use of the word that a, that a Jewish child would use for his father out of loving respect and adoration because he knows his father loves him and he is expected to be obedient and be a disciple of his father so that he can raise his children up to fear the Lord, to love only the Lord their God with all of their heart, all of their mind, all of their soul, all of their strength. It's not just love, but it's a loving obedience to the man who gave them life and led them to be a leader of their household. So if you just heard daddy, you have heard a truth, but you've heard a partial truth. Because unless you have that love and respect and adoration for your father because of the love that he has for you, and you see the reason that he's training you up, then you'll t tend to be like I was when I was a child. <laughs> my dad doesn't want my best interest. He's just a rule maker. I've all been there probably. But now as a man, I realize that was not the case whatsoever. He was a rule maker because he wanted me to become a man. I was blessed to have a good father. So it's easy for me to see the qualities of God as a father. Did I have a perfect father? No. Am I a perfect father? No. <laughs> not even remotely. So by his spirit, I pray that I can be a better father each and every day, that I can be a better husband each and every day. And I know that when I fall, he'll lift me up. So let's look at this word, Abba, and see how it was used, okay? It's only used three times. <clears throat> First one is in Mark 14, verse 36. So I'm going to read a little bit before that so you can see what's going on here. They, the disciples, the one that Jesus was training up, they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. So why did they go to Gethsemane? To pray. Why? Because the Son knew what the Father had asked Him to do, and it was beyond what was physically possible. That's why Jesus was in such distress that He sweated drops of blood. So He had to pray to His Father, not just to God, but His Father, for the strength to do what the Father had asked Him to do. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul even is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell on the ground, and he prayed that if it was possible, the hour might pass from him. Because what he had to do as a human being was hard, impossible without God. Verse 36 Abba, Father. We've got the Aramaic and the Greek word put together. Dad, Father. A relationship that you can't understand unless you're the son. Yeah, he might be a father. He might be a father, but this is my father. And he is also my dad. Because I know that he loves me and wants to protect me. I understand that because I am growing up out of my childish ways and becoming a man also. Each and every day. It's a growing process. <laughs> Abba, Father, everything is possible for you, though. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will be done. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, as Jesus is the way that earth and heaven will be reunited again, that you will be with your heavenly Father who loves you forever and ever and ever. How can I not respect that type of heavenly Father? How can I not love that kind of heavenly Father? How can I not be obedient? Whoa, there we go. I threw that one in. Because we still want to be rebellious children, don't we? rather than obedient children. We still want our own way today instead of what the Father is calling us to do. And Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after me. What does it gain a man to gain the whole world? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his very own soul? And as a man, as a father, you need to be training up your children. So 
God's one and only Son used this as a prayer language to His Father to help Him accomplish something that He needed to do. Second case is found in Romans 8.15. Paul is writing, Therefore, brothers and sisters, he's talking to believers who are born again by the Spirit of God. This is that chapter that talks about the Spirit over and over and over again. We have an obligation, a duty that we have to do. And it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, a person who will reveal all truth, Jesus, to us, because Jesus reveals the Father to us. By the Spirit you will put to death the misdeeds of the body and you will live now and forevermore. Verse 14, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. They have dad fathers in heaven that they can cry out to. And maybe you understand that a little better. The Spirit... you receive does not make you slaves so that you will fear again. I'm not saying Jesus feared, but he knew that he was distressed so much of what was in front of him. Again, or rather, the spirit you receive brought you about your adoption to sonship, just like Jesus Christ. You are his brother or sister. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, Dad, Father so that we can live these holy lives that we cannot do on our own. No matter how much you want to, you can't live the law, so the law can't save you. The law can only point to the sins that you have and condemn you. But Jesus Christ, it's like He had to go fill this woman's soul. He did not condemn her. He brought her living water because He loved her so much. When the rest of the world looked at her and said, she's probably not worth saving. But Jesus loved her and loves her. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children, that we have a dead Father in heaven. Something that I'm going to say again is beyond my comprehension that God could love me that much. Verse 17, Now if we are children, then we are also heirs. So you get this concept that I haven't showed you yet from Scripture. Heirs. That everything that the Father had belongs to me. And by the Spirit's power, all of that is at your disposal now. If I go to my dad and say, Dad, I'm in trouble. I need to borrow some money. Now he's going to, as a father, ask me why and everything else, you know. But he's there for me. And when Jesus teaches us to pray, he doesn't say that, this is going to be taken from you. He says that the Heavenly Father will give you the Spirit so that you can handle it. And that could be his, my dad's answer. He could say, you got in this trouble, here's what you need to do and make me do it. Who knows what the answer is? But your Heavenly Father will give you more and more of the Spirit so that you can deal with anything, especially if you're praying for God's will over your will. So we've got the example of Jesus using this word. We've got the example of Paul writing to believers to use this word so that they could live a life differently than they did before. So that their light would shine before men that that men may see your good works and glorify your God which is in heaven. God which is in heaven. The last usage of the word is in Galatians 4:6. I'm going to start in verse 1. What I am saying that as long as the heir is a child, now this doesn't mean a child, this means more in the way of lack of maturity. As long as the heir is lack of maturity, he is no different from a slave. Although he is the owner and the Lord of everything. I'm going to go back and use myself again because I always use myself as an example so I don't point fingers at anybody else. When I was a teenager, (laughs) remember being a teenager? You know, I thought, like I said, my dad was a dictator because these rules and things. And these rules meant he didn't love me as much as he should because if he loved me, he'd just give me all these things. You know, when I did this, he wouldn't necessarily punish me for it. But now I see differently as I've matured and became a man. I was nothing more than a slave to a king. 
because I saw him as authority, but I was so ready to get out from under that, and that's the way most teenagers are. Because I didn't realize the love of the Father and didn't realize I was an heir and that he was training up this prince to be the king, to be the ox of his family, to be a good father. Verse 2, he is subject to guardians and trustees until the day set by his father. So also, here's the spiritual principle, when we were children, we were enslaved or we were slaves under the basic principles of the world. We live for our fleshly desires, not for God. No matter how much you recognized Him and thanked Him and went to church and prayed and read, read your Bible, did you realize, do you realize God is your heavenly Father? Do you realize who you are as a child of God? Do you realize what's at disp your disposal because you have the Spirit and because you are an heir of God? You don't have to worry about daily bread anymore. He will supply it. You will be thankful for everything you have. Maybe we can be like the church in Acts where they sold everything and shared it in common because they said, it is not mine in the first place. It was given to me from God. Verse 4, But when the time had fully come, God sent His Son. Think about it as a dad father sending His Son born of a woman, born under the law, the holy standard that the Father had given us that, that we just thought was too hard, <clears throat> that we couldn't even comprehend until we reached maturity, until we received the Spirit. Did this, verse 5, to redeem those under the law that we might receive our adoptions as sons so that we could realize that God is our dad father in heaven who loves us so much and gives us everything we need to carry us through this world until we go home. Till we shed these tently bodies, as Paul says. Till we see Jesus as He is. Wow. Verse 6, And because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His sons into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. That's the three uses in Scripture. Jesus cried it out because of what He had to go through to save you. Paul writes that, that we cry out to the Father through the Spirit so that we can live a life differently than what we were before. And Paul writes again to this church at Galatia that we cry out to God to realize that we are children of God and use what's at our disposal and you may think that you don't have much but remember the woman that brought her two cents and Jesus said she'd give him more than anybody else there remember this woman at the well who went back and the disciples had already gone to town and they didn't bring anybody back with them to meet Jesus and she brings the whole town back and she didn't say anything but could this be the Messiah Not much of a sermon, but it's a heck of a sermon, isn't it? Do you want to find out who Jesus really is? I'm very sorry for those who didn't have a good father. Me, on the other hand, I had a good dad. I had a good father. He did make rules. He did enforce those rules, set those boundaries but I can't ever say that he didn't love me. Never. I can't say that he wouldn't give up his life to save me. Could he have been a better dad? We all can. <laughs> but I had a great dad that shows me what a heavenly father is even more and more of. So I'll take a second and thank my father. And I want to give him a Father's Day present. You guys that I gave these Bibles to, I've got a lot of good feedback about how good they were, so I'm giving my dad one as well. Happy Father's Day. So tonight, we go see my son, and hopefully I've trained him up in the ways of the Lord where he won't depart from it. And he gets to meet two more grandchildren that he's never met before. So 
So we got a good day planned. Do not ever think lightly of God as your Father. And know the Spirit that God personally lives inside of you where you can cry out, Dad, help me. Help me to be like Jesus in this world. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for being the perfect Father. We thank you for all fathers today because you've given them. Lord, help us to learn from their mistakes and learn from the way they trained us up correctly. Help us as men to be good fathers to our children, good grandfathers. Lord, we thank you for your desire to have a relationship with us. We thank you for the gift of marriage. We thank you for the blessing of families. We thank you that children are a heritage and blessing from the Lord so that they can continue on and teach their children as good fathers. That you are a good, good father. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.